Hello, this video is a review of a dash cam that I have been sent by Viofo. The dash cam is the A139 Pro and it is a 4K 3 channel dash cam. It's a top end model, they're very pleased with it and they asked me if I'd review it. I don't normally accept stuff for review, but I have been thinking it might not be a bad idea to have a dash cam in the van, partly because there are so many crazy drivers around and I include myself in that category, but also I was thinking that uh, just for making the vlogs it could be useful to have a dash cam because at the moment I use my little DJI Osmo action cam which I stick to the windscreen, but it's not designed as a dash cam and I have to reach up and press the button to record if I think something interesting is going on and that's, that's not ideal. What you really want is a dash cam that is just running continuously until it fills up the memory card and then it goes back and starts overwriting the oldest files and that is generally how dash cams work. So so I thought, let's get one, it would be a good idea to have it, and maybe I can use some of the footage in the vlog. So I'm coming at this from two slightly different perspectives. One, as a filmmaker, will this footage be any use to me making vlogs? And two, what's it just like as a dash cam, as a normal conventional dash cam? Now what you get in the box, particularly with this top end model, as I say, it's a three channel dash cam, which means it's got a forward facing camera, it's got a rear facing camera, and it's got another one that sits in the cab, so it can record you, or I suppose if you're a taxi cab or something, record passengers in the back. I don't know what the data protection implications of that are, but the point is it's got a third camera anyway, and that third camera even has some little infrared LEDs, so while you're driving along at night, it can still get an image of you without shining lights in your eyes and blinding you, which obviously would be a bad idea. They sent me a couple of accessories as well, which seem to be optional add-ons. The first one is this tiny little Bluetooth wireless remote. Now you might think, why on earth do you need a wireless remote on a dash cam? And it's because if something happened and you thought that has been recorded, I need to make sure that clip does not get erased. You don't want to be reaching up for the dash cam behind your rear view mirror and trying to find the button to say save that clip. So what you do is you sync up this little button um, with Bluetooth and you can stick that somewhere much more convenient like on your dashboard and then you just reach over and hit that button and the dash cam says right I'll mark that clip as locked. They also sent me this hard wiring kit and the idea of this is that you can run the dash cam uh, while the van is switched off and parked, they do suggest that this is installed professionally because it does involve wiring it into the van's electrics and I have not done that, that yet. I was going to see what I thought of the dash cam before I go to the bother of actually you know, getting in there and wiring this into the fuse box and all that kind of thing. Um, this is the actual main front facing camera. You can see there's the camera itself which swivels so that when it's on your windscreen you can tilt it up and down to get the uh, image the right way. It's got a little micro SD card slot there which is where it records the footage. Uh, what else? A little microphone jack there so it will record audio but of course it's going to be up there on the windscreen so it, it's a little bit distant but it does actually also have a little 3.5 millimeter jack socket so you can plug in an external mic so if you want to run one over here and just above your head so it'll get better sound you can do that as well then you've got some little connectors where you plug in the uh, rear camera and the internal camera there's a socket there which goes into power and it's got this kind of brackety thing so that this slots onto another bit that is the bit that you stick to the window so you can take this off um, presumably to make it less appealing to thieves you can just take it away when you are parked so it's a compact little thing no screen on it you'll notice which I don't think is a problem because a screen on a dash cam is going to be tiny. You're not going to be able to look at it while you're driving along, or you shouldn't be anyway. And if you're going to replay footage on it, well, if it's that small, you can't really see anything. So what you do is it it sets up a little Wi-Fi network which you connect your phone to, and then you can play and record clips, uh, not record clips, but play and uh, look at the clips on your phone. You also do all the configuration uh, for the dash cam on your phone. It's got so many different options because not only is the forward facing camera 4K and the other two are HD, but you can change whether that forward facing one is actually 2K. And in which case you do that, it offers you 60 frames per second instead of the normal 30. There's also a 24 frames per second option. There's many, many different options according to what you might want. Um, the 60 FPS does come with that trade off of not being 4K. It comes down to 2K, which is more than HD, it's something like 2550 by 1600 pixels. 
I will leave a link in the video description to the page for this so you can look at the exact specs. Um, either way, I've been driving around and taking samples at 4K 30 and, and then this 2K 60 and so on um, at night time and daytime. And I've got all these samples to show you in a minute. Um, there's little buttons on it, one for power, one for a start recording. Again, you're not going to really be able to reach these, but it doesn't matter. As soon as you turn the power on, the default is it starts recording, and that is what you want a dash cam to do. There's a button you can turn the microphone on or off, so if you don't want it recording sound, don't worry, you don't have to. You can also do that in the app. And there's a button for the Wi-Fi as well, plus some little indicator lights that just light up to let you know that the mic is on, that it's recording, that the GPS, because it has GPS as well, so it can record on the picture where you are, what speed you're doing, all those kind of normal dash cam functions. But of course, the big question is, is it any good? So the first thing we need to do is install it and then go off and test it. And yes, I have already actually done that, but here's the clips of me doing it. Some might say I ought to start by cleaning the outside of the window. And to be fair, they'd be right. But I'd say that's what windscreen wipers are for. So let's gloss over it. Here I'm just using a domestic glass cleaner and a bit of paper towel to make sure the inside of the glass is clean and not greasy. Then, noting the instruction said use a damp cloth, I wiped some water over the area with another bit of paper towel. Not sure I actually needed to do that. This seems to provide the adhesion for this odd little transparent sticker that seemingly has no glue on it, but nonetheless sticks tight to the windscreen and to which you later attach the camera. I did not do a brilliant job here, however, of getting the bubbles out from under the sticker, so I may have to peel it off and try again at some point. You'll see in the footage later there's a rainbow-like multicoloured blob at the top, which I think was where I didn't clean everything properly. I've plugged it into the cigarette lighter socket, which I already had a USB converter thing in, so that supplies power and it then generates its own little Wi-Fi network which you can tell your phone to connect to and then you can run their app. should have an image of the sky as it's pointing upwards at the moment. I will use this to angle the camera. Now it wants me to switch Wi-Fi type but I'll do that later. I will attempt to do this. Moment of no return, take the sticky back plastic bit off Get this straight. Press it firmly onto the sticky pad, which itself is only holding on through static or something. So what you do is you stick the camera firmly with the 3M tape to a little transparent pad that itself sits on the windscreen through some sort of um, static, they call it a static thing. It just doesn't seem right, it doesn't seem logical that that can work. However, we'll see if the camera ever falls off. And I now have a view out of my street. Good. It beeps a lot until you, until you, if it's not recording it beeps at you, it's so annoying. You can, however, change things in the settings. Let's see if I can turn the beeps off. Uh, notification sounds off. Seems to have done the trick. That is the internal camera, of course. It's got the little um, infrared things that uh, mean it can see what it's doing in the dark. And I'm just going to put it there on the dashboard for the purposes of testing because that one doesn't come with the little sticky thing that magically unsticks from the windscreen. This one actually just glues firmly on forever. So while I'm testing that is going to sit there with a bit of gaffer tape to hold it in place. And I have glued the magic button that locks the recordings conveniently at hand there. I thought if I put it near the hazard warning light switch that would be a good place because if I'm pressing that button it's because something interesting has happened. Rather than install all the wiring in a permanent fashion behind all the trim, what I'm doing is putting it behind things like the sun visor here, just wrapping it round, and that will do as a temporary fix while I test the dash cam. And also, of course, by temporary, I mean it'll probably stay like that until the end of time. The rear camera hasn't come out too bad, actually. The wiring emerges quite nicely up at the top there. Just has a little bit of a 
a cabling thing and then it just squidges between the woodwork and the top and then ends up with a bit of a coil of cable there but it's hidden from my view behind this and because the window's tinted you can't see it on the inside so there is the rear camera pointing out quite happily out the back that's actually not too bad wiring wise not pretty at the front but it's not bad with it all connected up and working I shall simply use it on upcoming drives and put that footage uh, after this and you can judge the quality in daytime and at night. We'll see what it's like. Just before we show the sample footage, a boring technical note. I am in the UK where the standard for TV production is 25 frames per second, as it is across, I think, all of Europe, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, large chunk of the world anyway, shoots at 25 or 50 frames a second. However, America shoots at 30 or 60 frames a second, and every single dash cam, without exception, seems to conform to the American standard. This one is no exception. It shoots at 30 slash 60. Now, if you try and put 30 frames per second footage onto a 25 frames per second timeline, because I edit everything in 25, because I'm in the UK, it can get a bit jerky and stuttery, or there's another way of doing it where the computer just kind of interpolates the frames and it all looks a bit mushy. I don't want to degrade the footage from the dash cam. I would rather present it to you as a, an honest representation of the image quality. So, what I'm doing is telling the computer that the stuff shot at 30 on the dash cam is actually 25. The effect of that is that it's slowed down very slightly, but you will see each, each image from the dash cam in its full recorded quality as it was by the dash cam. I hope that made some kind of sense. The idea is I'm just presenting the best quality of the dash cam to you, but the footage technically is slowed down slightly to make that happen. This first clip was filmed by the forward-facing camera at 4K resolution and 30 frames per second. The time, as you can see in the bottom right-hand corner, was almost 2pm. I'm going to stop it here so we can take a closer peek at the registration plates ahead. Clearly that Fiat plate is easily readable, and I could have a good stab at making out the VW Golf and the Mercedes. The cars in the second row are too distant, however. Out of Sandwell and Dudley railway station car park I go, and again let's zoom in on what's ahead. The Fiat, Ford and Audi are clear, the Skoda just about, and the Merc not really. Those cars were all stationary of course, so there's no motion blurring. Let's contrast that with cars going by on the road ahead. The black Vauxhall plate is legible, but the Corsa in front is not, and neither is the Seat on the other side of the road. How about this Ford? What's interesting, I think, is that the image isn't blurred in the sense that the motion of the car isn't blurry, so the lack of detail, I think, must be due to the compression of the image in the dash cam. And I notice they only use 45 megabits per second for this 4K image, and that is not a lot, so any fine detail will be mushy or lost. Contrast that with my DJI Osmo or my Sony AX43, which shoot 4K at 100 megabits per second, more than double the data rate. But let's not get carried away. This is a dash cam, not a cinema camera, and really it just needs to record enough detail to show who was at fault if there was a problem. So how does it do when I'm on the move and there are cars heading this way? Would it capture enough detail if one of them were to cause an accident? Supposing this Hyundai suddenly swerved out or something? Well, the plate is certainly legible enough to identify it. In other words, before any car gets close enough to you to do any damage, the plate would be nice and clear, and surely that's the most crucial point. Or you might be one of those folk who likes capturing people making driving errors and posting it on YouTube to mock or harass them, ignoring that they're just human and likely to have bad days every now and again. Let he who is without sin and all that but I digress. There's certainly plenty of crisp footage for general viewing of the road. Here's a great example of low bitrate compression. See the leaves on the tree? No, you can't really. It's just a green blur. That's the combination of some motion blur and the data compression in the dash cam. For contrast, here's the HD image from the rear camera of the same clip. HD, remember, so it's half the resolution in both axes, so a quarter of the detail of the forward camera. And whilst those are hard to resolve, 
This one's fine until it gets this far away. It's not great looking at that car going the other way. Our relative speed was about 40, I reckon, if that learner's doing 20 and I was up to 10 or 20 by this point. That's the Hyundai, which never comes into crisp focus. Let's switch to a little later on the motorway. I'm doing about 60 miles an hour here, overtaking these trucks, and their details are clear, as is the car in front and the one coming past on the outside. So is the road sign and the information screen. Let's see that from the rear cam as well. The Merc is clearly identifiable, as is the truck. The Mini is a great example of data compression artefacts though, look at that. The plate only becomes legible once it's here, but again, if it was going to hit you, that means it would certainly be clear by the time it did, and you'd have any evidence of erratic driving beforehand. Bear in mind again, the rear camera is HD only. OK, let's see what they're like under the worst conditions, i.e. night time. This is a well-lit motorway, my headlamps are on dipped beam, so can we read this car's plate? No, not at any stage. This example's no better, despite the car passing slowly, when there should be less blur and more time for the camera to get the detail. The car in the outside lane is both further away, but crucially going much faster, so it's indistinct, but the van overtaking me is doing so at a crawl, so you can make his plate out easily. Bear in mind that even modern TV studios with the best cameras in the world need huge arrays of lights overhead to make the picture crisp, and what you have here is a tiny dash cam with the road illuminated by a trivial amount of light, relatively speaking. I'd be amazed if any dash cam could handle this nicely. I've got the camera in Auto HDR mode, which means it automatically decides, based on time of day I think, when it needs to use HDR, which is a way of dealing better with lots of dark and lots of light all at the same time. Now HDR is only on the front facing camera. As for the back camera, it just blobs really, but on a rainy motorway through a grubby back window it doesn't really stand a chance of making out anything. And for the hardest test of all, this is an unlit road with just my headlamps on full beam. You'd get the gist of any car movements, but little detail. As another car approaches, I dip the headlamps, and the poor dash cam doesn't have much to work with, as shown here. No surprise that out of the back, it's just pitch black. There is an option to film at 60 frames per second on the forward-facing camera, but not at 4K. It's at 2K, which is not quite as low as HD, but it's not as much as 4K. 2K is something like 25, 50 pixels by something else. Anyway, it's pretty high resolution, but it's not 4K and it's not HD. And the upside of that is because it's doing 60 frames, you should get crisper images, because each image is that much quicker, but equally, the shutter speed is that much quicker, so it's letting less light in, so it'll be even worse at night time. The dash cam actually shoots this at a respectable 60 megabits per second, so it should be decent. However, I didn't really find it helped because of the trade-off of lower resolution. Finally, here's some footage from the interior cam during daylight. My jacket and jumper are not really that colour. It's something to do with the sensor detecting infrared, Speaking of which, here is the shot at night when it uses a little ring of infrared LEDs around the lens to see what you're up to. Conclusions then. I think any hopes I had of using footage from the dash cam as a source of footage for my videos have been, if you'll pardon the pun, quite quickly dashed. It is a dash cam and hoping for it to have camcorder quality video um, really was unrealistic. So that was unfair of me to expect that from a dash cam. So let's put that thought to one side. Um, it does a good image, obviously, and when you're looking at it wide, it looks okay, but when you zoom in, you get all the artifacting and aliasing of low bitrate video compression. Um, so that's not, just as a filmmaker, it's not good enough for me. However, as a dash cam, which after all is what it's being sold as, um, 
I think it does a decent job. To be fair, it's the first ever dash cam I've tried and properly looked into, but I have watched many, many dash cam reviews on YouTube because other camper van and RV channels I watch um, do quite a few. If you watch Love Your RV, Ray does quite a lot of dash cam reviews. He seems to get sent them quite often. So I've seen a lot of his footage. And as far as I can tell, this one does a pretty good job. Uh, obviously it comes with three cameras. It's trying to squish a lot of data onto a card. You know, if I'm being picky and pernickety, I'd like a higher data rate, or if they could use H.265 compression instead of H.264, it, it effectively doubles the data rate um, by using a different codec. I don't know if there are licensing reasons for the codecs and things why they wouldn't use H.265. Um, there's also the new AV1 codec perhaps they could look into using. That would give better image quality again. But look, it shows you what the cars around you are doing, and therefore if any of them were driving erratically or causing a problem, you would have a record of them doing that, and as they got close enough to cause you a problem, it, it would record their license plate and probably their faces as well in enough detail that you could ID the people in the car, and that surely is what you want a dash cam for. It's on sale at the moment. Hang on, let me just look it up on Amazon. Bear with me, I'll just check what the, uh, the price is on that. Via for... Right, I found it on Amazon for £330 with the front and rear cameras and not the internal camera, because it does come in various versions. You can have it with or without the internal camera. So the two camera version, £330. And let's just see if I can find... There's the non-pro version with three cameras for £260. And a lot of other different cameras from the same manufacturer with different specifications of all sorts of different prices. So the lesson here, I think, is go to your favourite supplier, whether it's Amazon or whatever, and look up the version you want. So it is not, by any stretch of the imagination, a cheap and cheerful dash cam, because goodness knows there are some very cheap and cheerful dash cams around. But it does boast a very good feature set. It has got a good quality sensor in it. As I said, Sony know what they're doing with making sensors, and it's certainly got lots of flexible options. I mean, little things I liked, for example, the camera at the back, I had to turn it upside down because of the way the wire came out, and you can, in the software, flip the image and then flip it the other way so that it looks proper on the recording. So there's lots of configuration. You can have it putting the GPS coordinates, you can have it putting the speed overlay, you can have it putting a number plate overlay. So whatever use case you have for a dash cam, it it seems to have all your bases covered. Whether the price is right for you and your budget in your specific application, obviously only you can decide. I think it does a good job as a dash cam. And the big question, am I going to keep it in the van and tidy up the wiring and actually have it as a permanent install? Yes, I think I probably will, because I think having a dash cam is a good idea, and I think this one does a sufficiently good job that I'm happy to have it in the van. That's about it. I think that's about all I can say. Any questions, if you want to pop them down below, I will try to answer them, or I may redirect you to Viofo. I will say they were very responsive to me on email, because the whole 25, 30 frames a second bit, I initially said to them, look, if you've got one that does 25 frames a second that will fit with my other camcorders and they sent me a custom version of the firmware now the reason i didn't use that long and boring won't get into it uh, but they were responsive that is the point i'm making so hopefully they would be to you as well thank you for watching hope you found this vaguely useful cheerio